morning. Now we're on time. Let's open this morning's service with number 62 from your hardback hymnal, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Let's all stand together. Number 62 in the hardback hymnal. Let's open our Bibles together to Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah 66. As you know, it's been very difficult for me to, to move on from Isaiah. <laughs> I so appreciated Robert Horton, uh, not Robert Horton, uh, uh, Robert Hawker, sorry Robert. Robert Hawker, is one of my favorite writers, concludes his commentary on the book of Isaiah by saying, Farewell, Isaiah. Farewell, our dear brother. Farewell, thy prophet of God, whom has spoken the words of truth to our souls. What a blessing. Um, we often find ourselves going back to Isaiah, so we'll do that, but for now... Uh, this morning will be our final message in this book as we've tried to go through verse by verse. I uh, want us to pray before we begin. And uh, before we do that, I want to welcome uh, a uh, dear friend and brother to our congregation, uh, uh, Michael Bolton, has uh, moved here from California. Uh, Michael's around here somewhere. Where did I see him? Oh, all the way in the back corner. All right. Michael, we're glad you're here, brother. He uh, starts a new job on Monday and will be living in, uh, up in the Lake Mary area. So I encourage you all to get to know Michael. <clears throat> all right, let's pray together. 
our merciful Heavenly Father. Oh, how hopeful we are that you would be pleased this morning to rend the heavens, to open up to us the mystery of the gospel, to reveal once again to our hearts, to our souls, the glory of thy dear Son, to cause us to look in faith to him and to rest all the hope of our salvation on him. We are completely dependent upon thy Holy Spirit to accomplish that blessing in our hearts. And so, Lord, we pray that you would enable us to forget about ourselves in this hour and to, to hear to hear your voice spoken from your word to our hearts. Open that which no man can shut. Put away our sins through the sacrifice of thy dear son. And give us hope in knowing that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sin. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> question that I want to try to answer this morning in this hour is who has reason to hope that the promises spoken by God through the prophet Isaiah are for them? Another way to say that would be how do I know that I have eternal life? And uh, how do I know? that the new heaven and the new earth is for me. Now, if you ask a Jehovah's Witness that, they would say, well, I'm working on trying to get into that 144,000. If you ask a free willer that, they would say, well, the hope is that I made a decision and I accepted Jesus as my savior and therefore I know that I'm... If you ask a reformer, they would say, well, you know, you have to evaluate your life and get the assurance of your salvation from that. What does God say? What does God say this new heaven and new earth is for? Who is it for? Here it is. Look at verse 22 of Isaiah chapter 66. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make. <laughs> now, the Lord not only makes the new heavens and the new earth, but he makes those fit for the new heaven and the new earth. And if he doesn't make it, it won't be made. So this isn't our work. This is his work. And this is how he leads through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the prophet Isaiah, to conclude this entire book of the gospel. He points us to the new heaven and to the new earth, which he will make which he will make. And that new heaven and new earth, which I will make, shall remain. It's not going to pass away. The heaven and the earth, as we know it, will pass away. But the new heaven and the new earth, which he will make, shall remain. Saith the Lord. <laughs> now there's our hope. This is, this is not my opinion or your opinion or, or anyone else's opinion. This is what God says. That's where, we, that's where we hang all our hopes. What saith the scriptures? What has God said? It doesn't matter what anybody else believes. What does God say? So shall your seed and your name remain. Remain forever. Everything in this world is temporal. You're temporal. I'm temporal. Everything's decaying. Everything's coming to an end. The heaven and the earth as we know it is going to be consumed by fire. But this new heaven, that's the one I'm interested in. I'm interested in the new heaven and the new earth because the Lord says that heaven's going to remain forever and it shall come to pass 
that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So all those fit for the new heaven and the new earth are going to worship me. <laughs> from the new moon to the new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath. In other words, the language here is 24-7 for eternity. <laughs> My people are going to worship me. They're going to bow before me. I hear people talking about going to heaven to meet so-and-so. And, -so. and you know, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. I said, if heaven is nothing more than an approved version of what we have here, that doesn't give me much hope. If heaven is nothing more than a family reunion, I've been to family reunions before. I'm not getting excited about that. Heaven is seeing him, worshiping him in the fullness of his glory being made like him, being rid of the sinful flesh. Now that excites my soul. That gives me hope. And then it cannot be overlooked that the Lord in his divine wisdom closes out this entire book with a word of warning. As he closes out the entire canon of scripture, you remember how that closes out? When the Lord brings this whole book of the gospel to an end, he says, if any man adds to the words written in the book of this prophecy, the curses of this book will be added unto him. In other words, if any man adds to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ for the hope of their salvation, the curses of this book will be added to him. And if any man takes away from the prophecies of this book, so his name shall be taken from the book of life. In other words, he has no hope of salvation. And so it is with the book of Isaiah. The Lord concludes this book of the gospel with this warning, verse 24. And they shall go forth, talking about those who are going to be worshiping him for all eternity, and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. They shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Met someone recently who said they believed in hell, but they believed in heaven, but didn't believe in hell. You can't have heaven without hell. This is you can't have life without death. You can't have the gift of eternal life without the judgment and wrath of God. And the Bible teaches both, doesn't it? Now I want to know what God says about how I'm going to escape the wrath and judgment of God and how I'm going to have hope of knowing that my name, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the Lord spoke to him. Remember the disciples, they came back rejoicing because the demons were subject unto them. And the Lord said, don't rejoice that the demons are subject unto you. Don't rejoice in that you see these temporal things. But rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. <laughs> and though I have reason to rejoice that my name is written in heaven. That this new heaven and new earth is not going to be anything like the old heaven and old earth that you and I know about in our experience is for me. Turn to me to Second Peter chapter three. <clears throat> this is the most pressing need, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I know we all have needs. We have we have the disappointment of our own sin. We have relationship issues that we desperately want to be made better. We have uh, financial problems. We have physical problems. But all those problems, all those temporal problems are like this temporal earth. They're going to come to an end. The greatest need that I have, the greatest need that I have is to know that I have a place in the new heaven and the new earth. And if I'm able to set my affections on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, then uh, whatever the Lord has ordained for me and whatever, whatever things happen to me and whatever things I do in this world, I can have hope of knowing that uh, I have everlasting life. 
<clears throat> Look what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. In verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. <laughs> oh, aren't you glad? Our God cannot lie. Every promise he makes, you can, you can hang your soul on the promises of God. And that's what we're doing. That's what faith is. Faith is believing God. Believing what God says. Who else are we going to be able to believe for the hope of our salvation? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. <laughs> Don't miss that. These promises are for usward. The promises of God are not for the world. They're for those that he saves out of the world. The world has no, has no reason to have hope in the promises of God. Those that are in Christ can, can trust. This is, this is for usward. It's amazing to me how people will take this verse of Scripture and they'll pull out a portion of it and they'll say, see there, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. It's God's will that everybody's to be saved. No, it's for usward. Look, look what he says. But is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any of usward... <laughs> should perish and none of us were you see whatever god's not willing to happen is not going to happen and whatever god is willing to happen is going to happen <laughs> god's will always reigns always he hath done past tense whatsoever he wills <laughs> with the armies of heaven and all the inhabitants of the earth no man can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou our god Reigns To say that God wills all men to be saved, but he's not able to get it done, is to put man on the throne of God and to make man to be God and to strip God. And someone, someone wrote me recently and said, well, you can't rob God of his glory. You can't rob Christ of his glory. You can if you give it to man. If you give it to man, you've done that. You've robbed Christ of his glory. Yes, he has essential glory in his nature, and that cannot be diminished, not by an ounce. But, but, but when man says that God's willing for, all but, for everybody to be saved, but he can't get it done unless you cooperate with his will, then your will becomes stronger than God's will. And that's not our God. That's not our God. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Everyone that God chose in the covenant of grace... <laughs> Everyone for whom the Lord Jesus Christ shed his precious blood, they're all going to be brought to repentance. They're all going to have their minds changed in the new birth. They're going to have their minds changed about who they are. They're going to have their minds changed about who God is. They're going to have their minds changed about how it is that God saves sinners. Because until the Lord gives us a changed mind, and that's what the word repentance means, until the Lord gives us a changed mind, we deceive ourselves in thinking that there's something good about us. We deceive ourselves in thinking that God's hands are tied until we let him have his way. We deceive ourselves in thinking that God's looking for something other than the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. But when the Spirit of God comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. You see, whatever is not of faith is sin. Whatever is not of faith. Men think that sin is just the stuff they feel guilty about. Just the bad things they've done in their lives. The mother of all sin, the root of all sin, the sin that doth so easily beset us is the sin of unbelief. And uh, when the Lord convicts us of that, we realize, Lord, I'm... Oh, I need faith. I'm, an, I, I'm not a believer. I need, I need for the Spirit of God to do what you sent him to do. <laughs> Convict me of my sin. Show me that my righteousness is in my substitute of righteousness because I go to my Father. I have a righteous advocate who intercedes on my behalf. And the only righteousness that God's impressed with <laughs> is the righteousness of his dear Son. 
And that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. God's people have been delivered from the, from the grip of Satan. They have been. The Lord Jesus Christ accomplished that. He's not going to lose one of his sheep. He accomplished their salvation, and in time, he's going to give every one of them repentance. Oh, aren't we hopeful today? The Lord will give somebody repentance. Lord, change my mind. But, look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That means you... you you don't expect a th if you're expecting a thief, you're going to be up and waiting for him, right? With the guns loaded, and uh, and 911 call. I mean, what this the Lord's going to come like a thief in the night. People are going to be sleeping, spiritually sleeping. They're not going to be looking for him. Who's he coming for? He's coming for those that are awake, spiritually watching and waiting for him. But the, but, the, but, but the unbeliever is going to be asleep. Oh, well, you know, i got plenty of time. <clears throat> In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now that's God's word as to all this stuff that we spend so much time and energy worrying about. Y'all have a dear brother, Lowry Beasy, who lives in Mississippi and watches our service. He's probably watching right now. He's been watching for years. And uh, Lowry's house, a couple months ago, was struck by lightning. And uh, Lowry's a year or two older than I am, and he and his wife have been married as long as Trish and I have. And uh, we just he's accumulated a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. And he said, uh, he said, you know, Greg, he said, just last week, I, my wife and I were talking, and we were, we were wondering, what are we going to do with all this stuff we've got? Well, we've got a big house just full of stuff. <laughs> he said, we don't have to worry about it anymore. The house burned to the ground. It's all gone. It's all gone. <laughs> and that's what the Lord's saying right here. One day. Lightning's going to strike. Fire's going to fall from heaven. They're going to burn up all this stuff that we so, we're so attached to. Seeing then. <laughs> seeing then, verse 11, that all these things shall be dissolved. <laughs> They're going to be dissolved. You drop something in acid and it just gets dissolved. Just go where to go. I don't know. It got eaten up. It's, it's gone. It's gone. If you knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that tomorrow was going to be your last day of life on this earth, what difference would that make in the way you live and what you think? That's what the Lord's saying. That's what the Lord's saying. Look what he says. Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Oh, Lord, give me the grace to, 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 to number my days. <laughs> to realize that, yeah, this is all going to be dissolved. Looking for. And hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, <laughs> here's our hope. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise. Now, Peter is referring to Isaiah chapter 66. The, ver the, word, the verses we just read to begin this message. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. <laughs> Two things I'm looking forward to in the new heaven and the new earth. Seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in all the splendor of his glory. Worshiping him as 
I ought and not having any sin. Wherein dwelleth righteousness? Why can't we see him like we ought now? Why can't we worship him like we should? Why can't we believe on him like we ought? And that's because of sin, isn't it? And when sin's gone, we're going to see him in the fullness of his splendor, the fullness of his glory. Eye has not seen yet, nor has ear heard, nor has it even entered into the imagination of man the things that he has prepared for us. What, what's it going to be like? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm sure looking forward to seeing it's, it's going to be glorious. We don't have anything. Put out of your mind the thought that heaven's an improved version of this world. That's what most folks think. They just think, well, you know, I'm not going to have the troubles and the, and the problems that I have here and everything's going to be. We're going to know each other like we knew each other. We're going to say, you remember when such and such? No, we're not. No, we're not. We have no memory whatsoever of this life. None. And we're not going to relate to anybody in heaven like we, based on a relationship we had with them here. When the, when the Pharisees brought that up, what did the Lord say? You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. To think that a man's going to know his wife in heaven as his wife? That's not the way it's going to be. <laughs> We're going to have perfect love for one another. All in his presence. Now that's the new heaven. That's the new earth. That's what is there here compared to that? Nothing. Wherein, beloved, verse 14, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace found of him in peace without spot and blameless now those are the folks that are going to go to heaven those that are found of him found of him oh lord find me find me and put me in christ because the only way that i'm going to be blameless the only way that I'm going to be without spot is to be found in the Lamb of God who himself is without spot and blameless. The only way I'm going to stand in the presence of a holy God is to have clean hands and a pure heart. And the only way that's going to be happening is if I'm found of him and found in him. First John, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Now John is going to close the canon of scripture in the, in the end of the book of Revelation by quoting from the end of the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah has 66 books, uh, 66 chapters in it. There's 66 books in the Bible. Um, and there's a transition that takes place uh, in, in, in the book of Isaiah at chapter 40. Remember chapter 40? Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And we can identify so many things of the Old Testament prophecies in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah and so much of the New Testament in the last 27 chapters, the revelation of Christ being made more clear in the latter part of the book of of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is a microcosm of the entire Bible is what I'm trying to say. And here in Isaiah chapter 66 he closes in the 66th book of the Bible words from the prophet Isaiah. And he says in verse 1, and I saw and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now, the, the, the sea or the oceans that divide the continents today represent in the scriptures two things. The sea represents separation, and there is a separation. There's a separation between us and the new heaven and the new earth right now. As long as we're here in this flesh, as long as we're in this world, there's going to be a sea. And the second thing the sea represents is the turbulence of this world. 
<laughs> the way of the Lord is through the seas. And how many times we see God demonstrating the trials and troubles of this life through the, the turbulence of the sea. And now he says, there's no more sea, no more separation, no more tears, no more troubles. For I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. What do we read in Isaiah? The new heaven and the new earth will remain. Remain. And they shall gather together and worship me. And God, verse 4, shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And if we have any memory at all of this world, we're not going to get the tears out of our eyes. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. <laughs> oh, is that, does that thrill your soul? Does that give you hope? The former things are passed away. They're gone. They're dissolved. They've been, they've been burned up with a fervent heat, as Peter says. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. Now, John's still quoting from Isaiah 66. I'm going to make this new heaven and this new earth, and I'm going to make all that are fit for it. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Whose words are you able to listen to and believe without any doubt or without any question or without any nuance, without any emphasis? Every word to be faithful and true. You, you can't speak that way. <laughs> and you don't listen that way to the voice of anybody, do you? You see, there's, there, there's emphases and nuances and untruths and misconceptions in every word that man speaks. Doesn't matter who it is. When God speaks, he says, these words are faithful. And they're true. Believe them. And he said unto me, it is done. I used this illustration last week. You've heard it many, many times, haven't you? The difference between man-made religion and the gospel is the difference between do and done. Man-made religion is all about something you do and you never know if you've done enough. So you never have assurance. You never have assurance. Tell them it's done. <laughs> it's finished. Everything that God requires for a sinner to go to heaven was accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, I can rest there. I can have hope in believing these words which are faithful and true. It is done. I am the Alpha. Now, you know that's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. And I'm the Omega. That's the last letter. I'm the A to Z. And everything in between. Any word that you can spell with the alphabet, that's me. That's me. Any word that's faithful and true, that's me. Now what the Lord's saying here is I'm the one who chose you. God placed you in Christ, in the covenant of grace, before Adam was ever made. That's the beginning of our salvation. It began with the love of God toward his people. And I'm the end of your salvation not only, I, and I'm everything in between. I redeemed you, I called you, I kept you, and I'm going to deliver you faultless before the throne of God. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm everything. And when God shows you that Christ is everything, you come to this conclusion, I am nothing. Nothing. 
He's everything. Everything. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Freely. Come. Any man thirst? Come. Drink. Drink. Now, I'll tell you who's not thirsty. The people who are not thirsty are the people that are having their thirst quenched satisfactorily by the things of this world. Now, I know every one of us drink from the bitter waters of the broken cisterns of this world. But the difference between those that are thirsty and come to Christ and those that are not, some folks are satisfied by that, by that putrefying water. Some folks, some folks just drink it up and they think, you know, this is life. This is everything. This is, oh, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> and the child of God drinks of it and, 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 and it's so bitter. Doesn't, doesn't quench his thirst. He's got to have something clean. He's got to have a, clea, a, a, a river crystal clear which, thrones, which flows from the throne of God. <laughs> got to have it. Got to have Christ. None of this stuff, none of this stuff meets my need. Verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he'll be my son. Now, I've met people before that have overcoming ministries. And by that, what they mean is that uh, you've overcome sin. You've overcome an addiction, you've overcome this, and you've overcome that, and you live a higher life now, and you walk with your feet off the ground, and you just are, you, you're, a, you're an overcomer, you're a spiritual person who's, who's learned by your, by your effort, and by the grace of God, they won't, most folks that, that, that believe they're overcomers uh, would not say that I did it all myself. God enabled me. <laughs> you know, they're like that. They're like that publican who, who I mean, he. What did he say? God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men. Isn't that what he said? He gave God the credit. <laughs> he believed himself to be an overcomer. He said, I, I, I fast twice a week. I, I give to the poor. I do good works. I, I, you know, and I'm not like that publican over there. He's not an overcomer. Look at him. He won't even look up. He's beating himself on the breast and saying, God, have mercy upon me. I'm the sinner. And the Pharisee believed himself to be the overcomer, didn't he? <laughs> so what does God mean when he says, he that overcometh? He that overcometh. What is an overcomer? If it's not that, if it's not that self-righteous, pharisaical spirit of thinking, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not living in sin anymore. I'm an overcomer. What does God say an overcomer is? Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. It's very clear. It's very clear. It's very simple. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 4. For... Whatsoever is born of God <laughs> overcometh the world. <laughs> Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Nicodemus, you've got to be born of the Spirit. You've got to be born from above, the new birth. I will make the new heaven and the new earth, and I will make those fit for the new heaven and the new earth. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to cause them to be born again. And everyone that I cause to be born again is an overcomer. You see, there's only two kinds of people in this world. Those who overcome the world 
and those who are overcome by the world. And everyone who overcomes the world is born of God. And everyone who doesn't overcome the world wasn't born of God. Now I'm going to continue this message in a few minutes. I had another message prepared for this morning, for the second hour, from the book of Mark. Maybe the Lord will enable us to incorporate both these messages together, but I want to continue on this thought. What is it to be an overcomer? Who is it that overcomes the world? Because everyone, that over, everyone that's born of God, everyone that's born of God is an overcomer. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back in a few minutes. <laughs>